So when you get a poll and it says, well, this morning 82% said X, the next question is, yeah. And what are they going to say after they think about it, after they put it in context, after they talk it out? Because then they're going to begin to have public judgment. I believe that this, this sense of frustration is at the heart of the permanent tension between reform and reality. What you get is people who jump up and they say, I have a new idea, and they're, they're on fire, and they're ready, and they're excited. But the fact is that it's going to be slow. It's going to take a while. It's going to be hard. And it's easy, I think, at that point to break down and to start getting cynical, when in fact, very often, the system's working. It is doing what the Founding Fathers designed it to do. It's making you prove that your reform is strong enough and good enough to really be worth changing and having people have to obey a difference. One of the things about entrepreneurial free enterprise is that it tries to solve the frustration by applying common sense. That if you think about this model, what the Founding Fathers wanted to do was have as few things as possible in limited effective government because they expected it to be slow and frustrating. So they wanted to decentralize away from the government, creating wealth, owning property, what you do with your, with your money. They wanted to decentralize away from the government your right to organize any civic group you want to to go and do the things you believe in. They wanted to decentralize away from the government, establishing the cultural values of the society. Because here you can allow people to do things very quickly because they're not government. But then they wanted to say, now wait a second. When you start using the power of the state, and there's a great phrase from Washington where he talks about the danger of the state. And that, and that the power of the state is like fire, that it, can, that it can burn you, and it's very dangerous. And in that framework, they wanted to make sure that this was deliberately limited and deliberately difficult, because they thought it was the power to destroy. And they were very cautious about giving the government power. So tremendous opportunities in the society at large, very hard in the government itself. Somebody who I think did describe, and I mentioned this last hour, Somebody who I thought really described the emotion and the spirit and the sense of being an American is Woodrow Wilson. And this is from a speech he gave to a, to a group of brand new citizens who had just become Americans, people who were first generation immigrants. I think you'll find it very interesting. This is the only country in the world which experiences constant and repeated rebirth. Other countries depend upon the multiplication of their own native people. This country is constantly drinking strength out of new sources. It is as if humanity had determined to see to it that this great nation, founded for the benefit of humanity, should not lack for the allegiance of the people of the world. You have just taken an oath of allegiance to the United States. Of allegiance to whom? Of allegiance to no one, unless it be to God, certainly not of allegiance to those who temporarily represent this great government. You have taken an oath of allegiance to a great ideal, to a great body of principles, to a great hope of the human race. You cannot dedicate yourself to America unless you become in every respect and with every purpose of your will, thorough Americans. You cannot become thorough Americans if you think of yourselves in groups. America does not consist of groups. A man who thinks of himself as belonging to a particular national group in America has not yet become an American. And the man who goes among you to trade upon your nationality is no worthy son to live under the stars and stripes. My urgent advice to you would be not only always to think first of America, but always also to think first of humanity. You do not love humanity if you seek to define humanity into jealous camps. Humanity can be welded together only by love, by sympathy, by justice, not by jealousy and hatred. It is a very interesting circumstance to me, in thinking of those of you who have just sworn allegiance to this great government, that you were drawn across the ocean by some beckoning finger of hope, by some belief by some vision of a new kind of justice, by some expectation of a better kind of life. No doubt you have been disappointed in some of us. Some of us are very disappointing. But remember this, if we had grown at all poor in the ideal, you brought some of it with you. A man does not hope for the thing that he does not believe in. 
And if some of us have forgotten what America believed in, you, at any rate, imported in your own hearts a renewal of the belief. You are enriching us if you came expecting us to be better than we are. You have come into this great nation voluntarily seeking something that we have to give. And all that we have to give is this. We cannot exempt you from work. No man is exempt from work anywhere in the world. We cannot exempt you from the strife and the heartbreaking burden of the struggle of the day. That is common to mankind everywhere. We cannot exempt you from the loads that you must carry. We can only make them light by the spirit in which they are carried. That is the spirit of hope. It is the spirit of liberty. It is the spirit of justice. Now that's Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, talking at a time when we had massive immigration and there was an effort to figure out how do you define this thing we call America. And in fact, uh, he is one of the people who defined the modern American tradition of liberty. But I want to now walk you through what, what I, th I spent a lot of time thinking about what's going wrong. And I believe one of the things that's gone wrong is in the core values of the elite. And in particular in the way in which the elite, whether it's in the academic world or in Hollywood or in the news media, has misunderstood how a free society operates. And it seems to me that there are two traditions that are in conflict. And I want to walk you through these two. I, I do it building around two particular individuals who happen to be at the Baltimore Sun. But I think you can make a pretty strong case that these two traditions are remarkably different. Uh, and and the, the two people I want to use are H.L. Mencken and Frank R. Kent. Now, Frank Kent is not well known today because his tradition was defeated psych intellectually. Mencken represented the sort of cynical uh, contempt of humanity kind of view that assumes that everybody is somehow a crook, everybody somehow has failings, everybody somehow is doing something that, that is contemptible. Frank Kent was the political reporter in the same period, where Mencken was sort of a social critic and literary types love him. Frank Kent loved politics. He wrote a book called The Great Game of Politics. I was introduced to Frank Kent by a uh, reporter turned editor named Paul Walker, who'd been a reporter in the 30s and 40s. And then it opened up a, a paper called the Harrisburg Home Star, which was a weekly giveaway paper. And I'd gotten to know him as almost in the William Allen White, uh, the Andy Griffith Show model of the, the local newspaper editor who's a wise man and who's very nice. And he took me under his, his arm. And he had me read Kent's works because he said, Kent understood how politics really works. We actually have a, uh, uh, see, I guess we don't have Kent's book here. But it, it's, it's, it's out of print now, but it's worth, it's in libraries. And Kent went out and really looked at and lived with and enjoyed politics. And he was honest about it. Now, the difference is that the cultural elites despise politics. I believe they despise politics, first of all, because most of the modern cultural elite starts with the Whig reaction to Andrew Jackson. And the Whigs disliked the way in which Jacksonian democracy took over Washington. In fact, you don't get a really good biography of Jackson for about a century and about 140 years, 130 years after he's president. It's only when this, uh, Schlesinger writes his book, uh, which reestablishes Jackson as a precursor to FDR. But for a long period, the Whig historians didn't like Jackson because he represented the rise of populist sheer numbers, democracy in the masses. Uh, then you get uh, what is largely a Protestant economic elite in the progressive movement reacting to the Catholics who are taking over the big cities. 